welcome and thank you, uh, Dr. Sangeeta Ghosh, for agreeing to this conversation. Uh, recently, as uh, there was a, yet another amendment to the insolvency bankruptcy code that was passed in the parliament without much discussion. So in this context, uh, we thought that it would be important to uh, you know, relook at uh, the insolvency bankruptcy code and how it had come in and also what this particular amendment means and the implications of this on the sectors. So uh, thank you and uh, we can we can just go into the questions on uh, the insolvency bankruptcy code. Uh, firstly, as we know, the um, insolvency bankruptcy code or uh, IBC as it is called is uh, something that came in, uh, it's a legislation that was passed in uh, 2016. And with, if you can, uh, you know, in the la uh, last uh, four or five years that it has been uh, in act, like there has been multiple changes and amendments to it. So if you could uh, briefly give uh, the objectives and the process in which, and the context in which this legislature came about. And also uh, if you can explain the, you know, the term haircut, because that is something that has almost become synonymous with IDC itself. Right. So the process of recovery of loans that are institutional loans that are given out to large and small firms in general to firms. So the process of recovery of the, the loans uh, was, was something that faced a multiple uh, channels of difficulties uh, before. And even now, actually, because our non-performing assets, because of you know various problems that are encountered in business often, if a business does not do very well, it can turn into uh, a non-performing uh, you know, asset. So then it becomes a big problem. The recovery becomes a huge problem. And before it was, before the IBC code came in, it was uh, seen that these cases would be held up for long in courts and tribunals, which would not be good for the company that is undergoing the process of, of insolvency or liquidation, you know, or it would not be good for the creditors as well. So so, and there were multiple platforms and channels through which these legislatures would, you know, wind their way through. So it was not really helpful in that context. There were problems with the regime of uh, dealing with insolvency processes, you know, that existed before. When IBC came in, it was, uh, you know, this thought to be this hallowed mechanism, which would ensure that uh, insolvency resolution processes become easier and, uh, it was uh, basically turned around a little bit so that it facilitated the creditors to kind of take control of their own debts. So they could ask in a uh, follow, there was a time period given uh, in, within which the resolution has to take place firstly. And the process was simplified in many ways through the IBC. But what happened was that uh, you know, through the years, so it's only since 2016 that I, the IBC court kicked in, and there is the availability of a few case studies really that we have, you know, there haven't been too many, but what the resolution mechanism now shows us is what has happened is that, uh, say a company has a, uh, a credit of 1000 or, or you know uh, basically during the taking of the loan there is a either a collateral that is to be given and the asset value is monetized in you know in case of liquidation what will happen so often this asset value that is uh, the market value of the asset and the real value of the asset there is a difference between that so that is what is called a haircut so for example say something is of 1 lakh rupee the asset value, it is by the board of IBC that value is put and by, you know, a group of, so that the creditor will have their voice, the uh, everybody on the board, all parties, all stakeholders will have their voice in deciding what that value of assets will be. But often it is say put at 40% or even lesser or more of the original value of the thing. Now that is because the value of an asset in production and the value of the asset as as just a piece of machine 
you know, is very different. So say any, any machine, say a power loom machine, the, when it is in production or a steel machinery, when it's in production and to, to a party that can use the asset in production, the value is much higher than what it would be as a uh, thing itself. So that is what is meant by haircut, this difference between the real market value of the thing and the value that is given if it is to be liquidated, right? Now, what has happened through the IBC is often these asset values are seen to be put at a much lower lower value. So it's like 40%, 17%. These are the kind of percentages we have seen the value to be put at. And therein comes also the new problem that has come in with the IBC. So while IBC looked at resolving some of the problems of the past regime of insolvency governance, it has created a new one through the mechanism of, through a very wind, uh, long winded mechanism actually. So what has happened now is that uh, a company, it was seen in many of the cases that a company could uh, buy, uh, could take a loan, build those assets, then those assets are given, uh, market, are, are through haircut put at a lower value. And then once, if the company declares bankruptcy, those assets are then liquidated at 40% of the original value. So one lakh becomes 40,000 and then a third party comes and buys it. The third party often being one who uses the same things in production. It was in fact seen that the same party could buy it. So the the, the debtor himself or herself could buy the asset, you know, and that was now that was recognized as a problem and that was not allowed but you know there were various mechanisms through which through intervention of family or other conglomerates of business it was seen that it was possible to rebuy you know uh, this asset so that became the uh, very problem of ibc okay uh, because uh, it was almost like whatever if it's particularly if public money is involved it goes into funding the business of an enterprise and then through IBC haircuts happen and the asset value is kind of devalued and then declares bankruptcy and the thing is sold off. So that was the problem of IBC. One of the things that comes to mind is that this valuation that is done through a multi-party intervention really should be thought about uh, when, you know, so this is a, this part, if it is kind of resolved, IBC could be a good thing. Uh, but this is something very important that really needs to be uh, resolved. In fact, uh, the tri tribunals in themselves have also seen this problem. It, there is recognition of this problem in various commissions. It's not something, you know, that uh, is not has not been pointed out even by their own committees. As you were saying that, you know, there are, you know, problems that has been recognized uh, uh, with IBC. But uh, despite... Uh, the problem, one of the justification or one, one of the reasons why IBC is uh, kind of, uh, you know, supported or, you know, further is also say uh, both from the government and the RBI that the recovery rates of, of uh, IBC has been at 45%, which is when compared to other recovery mechanisms like BRT or SARFRACI Act. So, then this percentage is put at a, a very high rate. And so hence IBC is uh, said to be working better and that it is a very new legislation and it'll pick up. But how do we look at this percentage of uh, 45%? Like there have been uh, questions or, which has been raised in, from the floor of the parliament too. So how do you see that, uh, you know, this percentage of 45% uh, uh, is coming about? Like, is there a problem within that? Only. So this 45% uh, is perhaps an average over years. So the recovery rate from IBC for a few cases have indeed been very good. So for example, Bhushan Steel, which is a large part of the IBC, uh, you know, the number of cases and the value of the assets also, that itself was a case where the recovery rate was very high. So in some cases where the recovery rate is very high, it really does push up the average. And it is a it is not a huge improvement over the Sarfrazi Act, for example. It is a slight improvement, definitely, in the, in the terms of percentage. But at the same time, the, av the average muddles things. And the point really is that uh, even if it has a recovery rate of 45%, this uh, 
you know this kind of haircut and buying out of assets should not be allowed on public money so there you know in spite of the recovery rate uh, even if it is an improvement there has to be a mechanism to put this in check so that the malpractice doesn't uh, happen and so that ibc you know if it is doing well it should do better i mean in any way you know but one thing is there that the 40% 45% recovery rate might not be a very celebrated thing so there needs to be a caution around that because it is an average over years and it is building because of a few cases that were higher of course a lot of research really needs to be done on ibc you know uh, to look at a case to case evaluation of what is happening when when the enterprise is going through the ibc yeah you did uh, mention about uh, the bushen steel and and a few cases which are uh, trumpeted as uh, uh, also the few cases that has actually marked up this percentage of contributed to this 45% right. but uh, on one hand we see that and uh, you, as you correctly pointed out that these few cases are the ones that are contributing but overall that you know the recovery rate is not uh, very great but even within these uh, few cases we have seen uh, something like the electro uh, steel that has been sold off at 60% uh, of haircut and it was brought by vedanta at 40% of its original price and again like the alok Uh, industries Absolutely. which had 83% uh, haircut and it was bought by reliance at 17% of its original price so uh, in uh, then how do we uh, look at it is is the one uh, loophole that uh, is it a loophole that has been exploited like you had mentioned one of like the same people uh, buying or like the same debtor who can manipulate um, the family or other can uh, you know business relations to buy over but here we also see a trend of these big corporates again uh, getting into the game and buying uh, this uh, these assets at a very throwaway or like very cheap uh, right. cheap price so do you see that this is something that uh, will have a huge impact in the future or is it a very common feature with ibc uh so yes in increasing number of cases we do see the haircut rates to be as uh, to be such that you know when the when the uh, assets of the enterprise are being auctioned out it's almost as scrap value which shouldn't be the case you know which should not be the case it should not be that there is a haircut of 83% when the thing mm. is being sold off in production to mm. so the buyer you know it it uh, should not turn into a mechanism of uh pony capitalism you know it should not turn into a mechanism for that there has to be a way to safeguard that and one of it would be perhaps looking at the valuation process you know uh the board the ibc board they really need to uh, look at the valuation process and who the third party buyer is also you know uh because see the creditors uh, often are are also uh you know sometimes they just might be a little like too happy with a, even a lower rate of recovery you know but and it gets complicated because the debtor is declaring bankruptcy so it's like do we get back our money at all or do we at least get to recover some part of it it is a tricky situation but you know that should not allow big companies or even these you know uh, way arounds for the original debtor to kind of be a willful defaulter and then you know uh, yeah so there has to be a safeguard mechanism against this and perhaps valuation is one of the suggestions you know i'm sure there are there are plenty more that can be done in in, in you know in legal ways but um, valuation surely would be one of the important things too. yeah i think that is a very important point of how do you value uh, an yeah, asset like even if it is not in the when it is sold off to a third party in production hmm. yeah definitely it's not and the scrap scrap you know so yeah yeah and and uh, particularly given that the public sector banks have uh, been one of the cred uh, creditors like most of these haircuts also come back to them and well, which is public money and big loans the non recovery there i think has a different impact with the public sector banks and that's a different story altogether but just coming back to the uh, ibc uh, recently uh, we uh, you um the theme of this particular conversation also 
uh, is on the recent amendment that was passed because this time i think a significant change has been to add the msme sector also within ibc so if you could uh, explain one on the uh, amendment itself what it means for the sector and you know ha- will there be any difference of how they look at the you know formal or the la- uh, large larger sector or msme will there be different rules or and how will that uh, impact uh, the sector itself and if these are the problems that are already existing in uh, ibc then how will that you know kind of impact uh, the msme sector so the main amendment uh, that has happened now is a pre packaged uh, solution kind of thing for msmes what it means is that the msme can retain control over their own enterprise even if it declares bankruptcy so what that would mean is that see so now for example these big companies such as sr steel bhushan steel you know even alok industries they were ready to be bought over to be acquired kind of you know whereas for msmes nobody really wants to run a small enterprise so the problems of msmes versus you know larger firms is very different also the amount of credit that they usually take is much smaller then that that is taken by large companies right and their assets values often might even be larger much larger than the amount of loan that is taken that has been taken you know so what happens for an msme is slightly different than what happens for large firms so with that uh, you know there was a uh, there was a uh, demand a, a want for the ibc to look at msmes differently and in a way this uh, amendment to put the debtors in charge of their own companies so they can go through a mechanism to kind of declare how much of loans they can give back you know but the operations of the firm remains with the debtor this has been seen largely by the msmes as a good thing however there are huge problems uh, in this because of what has happened last year to the msme definition itself so now the msmes have become 60% of the companies that exist in this country suddenly you know by the change of the definition of msmes so now any enterprise which has a turnover of less than 2 250 crores qualifies to be an msme and this turnover excludes exports so even a mic a, a huge exporting firm with a certain you know low level of investments could even be a micro ent- enterprise you know so this has in and particularly in the period of the pandemic when actually a concerted effort to help the most vulnerable within the msmes was required the definition of msmes was expanded now the thing is the msmes are a priority sector and being a targeted priority sector means that they were eligible for collateral free loans they were eligible for government backed guarantees in in taking loans they were eligible for most importantly for public procurements because you know the public sector firms would be would would have a mandated percentage they had to buy from msmes right so now when you have this small you're supposed to have a small pool of beneficiaries and you suddenly expand the pool to bring in the bigger players you know inside that same ambit of targeted beneficiary that itself is a huge problem now with the ibc code and the you know the huge uh, the whole uh, thing about npas msmes ibc what ha- npas being non performing assets what happens now is so as i was telling you before credit could be institutional by banks and non banking financial institutes it also could be operational creditors so for example a steel firm running itself or any company you know buys raw steel from one company it buys other raw materials from other companies and all this buying of inputs is on credit right so these are operational creditors now what happens with this amendment is that the and msmes are often creditors to each other in that universe you know so if a bigger firm if a bigger msme now defaults there is a huge possibility of there being a cascading effect on the smaller firms so this insolvency of one firm if that firm refuses to pay back the operational creditors or actually see the act says that you can fix this 
So you need not go through the entire mechanism of IBC. You can fix the amount of loan through a you know through a one to one face to face without public disclosure kind of an arrangement to talk to your creditor and come to a terms that uh, you know this is the amount of credit I am ready to give back. So this will be your recovery date. I will not be able to give back the you know one lakh rupees that I took from you. I'll give back this much. Now, one lakh, of course, being a nominal you know conversational figure. So now what happens is that, and this is to be done with sixty six percent of creditors, right? Now there is a huge chance that the smaller creditors you know will be left. So there is nothing really. So on paper there is something to guarantee delay of payments and everything else. But there is a fear that. With MSMEs becoming so much larger now, the whole definition becoming so much larger, there are much more bigger players now involved in this. And the IBC being this mechanism in which you know there is no uh, re like the recovery might just not be possible for operational creditors who then themselves that can become insolvent. I mean, thank you for bringing that aspect of uh, how. You know the definition itself has uh, changed and was changed during the pandemic, yes. and especially uh, when uh, MSME, uh, I mean, people from the MSME sector were actually uh, asking for you know a package or you know some kind of economic uh, relief at that point of time. Uh, but uh, you know, combining these two things, MSME sector is also one of the biggest employers in the country today. And we, uh, and when in IBC, at least like, I mean, so far, uh, whatever we have seen uh, is that at least uh, four out of five cases that come goes to liquidation than, uh, you know, any other part of uh, resolution. Right. So uh, given this kind of a data, then if we uh, um, kind of extrapolate that and you know, assume that it might be the same for uh, this MSME sector also, then what is the impact that it would have on the employment? Because right now we already have like a more than alarming rate of uh, unemployment currently, and which uh, has been, you know, intensified with the pandemic and lockdown and multiple other things. So then, you know, in this context, how are we looking at, uh, you know, yeah. unemployment rate and what is the impact that it will have One of the uh, justifications for this prepackaged solution is also so that the employment and and the employees are protected because if the debtor is in control of their own enterprise then you know at least it does not completely go out of business and re more restructuring is perhaps possible so that is the justification that is there you know on paper however see the msmes themselves a large part of them are in the you know, in the informal economy, in and a large part of them uh, are not governed by uh, any labor protection in any case. So, um, you know, so what you see is that uh, some now with the, in fact, now with the uh, broadening of the definition of MSMEs, there will be more and more factories that were under the Factories Act, perhaps, that will also get covered so maybe they will receive a little bit of protection from liquidation, you know. But for the for the large uh, uh, magnitude of the enterprises, the labor situation does not change. There was no protection before. There was there is really no protection now. As far as losing employment is concerned, it depends on the fate of the company. And you know, often when a squeeze happens on the markup and the profit margins, the squeeze is kind of, you know, a uh, little bit cushioned through cuts in wages, ex over time, etc. So those practices of, the you know, practices of uh, suppression of labor that were there before, uh, one does not see uh, how these amendments would per se help, you know. But as far as perhaps if, like um, some protection to the, uh, to the, to the, like to the minority of labor that actually received protection already, perhaps not liquidation is a good thing, you know, in that sense. Yeah, we can hope so. Can but hope. Uh, given that uh, labor, I was uh, talking to the other day. Like basically, mm -hmm. the MSMEs often are under not under the Factories Act, and they have broken their units up. You know, it 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 is a practice that is seen 
a lot with enterprises. So you will see it in a lot of cases that the enterprises break up units to, to escape the labor laws, to employ on paper more, less than 10 workers. They will have double books of accounts to, to not, not adhere to the, you know, to the labor laws. So these are practices that are seen in, they're, they're there, you know, yeah. So IBC in no way can resolve those, those problems. Yes, but against liquidation, uh, you know, it is sad for a company to get liquidated and particularly if it's for genuine reasons, you know, and unfortunately during the pandemic, such cases might increase uh, manifold. And frankly, the fear is that with the definition of IBC being like amended now, you know, these, if the process like kind of just allows for more and more malpractices, that really is a concern because while you're wanting to do good for the MSMEs, you have broadened the definition. And if they declared themselves insolvent and don't pay back their operational creditors, then those operational creditors might suffer and in turn become insolvent. So it's a, you know, it's a bad money world that way. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sangeeta. And especially like, uh, you know, when you are bringing in the, uh, aspect of how it has impacted, uh, you know, the sector has been impacted during the pandemic. And uh, on one hand, you only have a very credit-based, uh, you know, yeah. relief package. And on the other hand, uh, you have now brought in the IBC. Yeah. So yeah. now it is, whether it is going to help yeah. the, uh, yes. you know, the sector or not, it is definitely tying it into a very vicious circle. So yeah. on, once you are into it, then you are kind of, you know, maybe at the end of the day, selling it to a bigger company. And given that the definition is also broadened and you now have, uh, you know, mechanisms like vulture capitalism, venture, a lot of things coming in and a debt-based, uh, you know, economy that is kind of uh, growing. So then definitely uh, all of these things are something that we need to be more cautious about. This is one thing, you know, what you said um, wants me to make, make like point out too, which is this, that even the credit-based uh, uh, kind of helpline that the government let out, you know, it was for companies that already had a debt. I mean, as in they had already taken a loan as of February 2020, you know, so they were not fresh loans. So, you know, a company needing a fresh loan could not apply for one if they needed extra working capital. So it was only companies who already had the paperwork in place, everything else in place, and already had a running loan that could take more loans. And then you broaden the definition. So, you know, one just has to connect the dots to know where this is going. Seriously. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, you know, for this, uh, as you were saying, it is not just like, uh, you know privatization but more of a corporatization of everything so all smaller businesses has anything that is you know at a local level or you know a smaller um, medium to middle scale has been like a kind of and the informal sector also has been uh, decimated uh, so in this context like really thank th thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be here and explaining nice, in uh, yeah. such detail. Nice talking to you. And to so you. it was really great talking to you. Thank you, Sangeeta.